Hey everyone, this is John Fennick with the Fennec Commodities Report. With me today are two executives from Sonoro Gold. Uh, one of the stories that we've talked about before, um, we have Ken McLeod, CEO, and John Darch, the chairman. Welcome, gentlemen. Hello, John. Pleased to see you again. Hello, John. Great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Um, you know, with all the news with uh, Mexico in, in October, I thought it was timely to have a follow-up interview. For those of you that didn't see it, uh, my YouTube partner, Don Durrett, and I interviewed these two gentlemen just a few weeks ago, and that is uh, on my uh, YouTube channel right now, which is called Fennec Commodities Report. You'll see that information on the, the footer at the very end of this presentation. Uh, also, a standard disclaimer, uh, we have a disclaimer that is quite lengthy that's on our website, which is called fenicconsulting.com, which talks about the fact that we buy and sell stocks frequently, and we may be owners of Sonoro uh, or any of the stocks that we talk about. I think that's just par for the course these days, but I do want to just get that out there. So, gentlemen, um, why don't we start with you, Ken, to give us a little bit of an overview. I see you have a few slides here. Uh, and um, we'll do that for about 10 to 12 minutes, and then I'll just ask some questions of the group uh, or myself. I'll, I'll, shoot, I'll shoot you some questions. Uh, thank you, John. <clears throat> Delighted to do so. I'm going to share the screen, first of all, uh, to bring up the presentation. <clears throat> and uh, let's go with this right now. I'll share the screen. Okay. And let it show from the beginning. <clears throat> so we have, here we have a snapshot of the, the region that uh, Cerro Caliche is situated in, in northern Sonora, Sonora, Mexico, just uh, close to the border with Arizona. And I'll go straight into a summary of, uh, of what makes a company such as Sonora successful. And it starts off with five key elements. The first, of course, is the team. It's the underpinning of any company. The success of any company is based upon the history and the knowledge and the dynamics of the team that operates uh, the company and the projects. And we have a team of four people right now that are the head of the management team of, of Sonoro. Two of them here sitting at, uh, at in Vancouver currently, John Darch, my colleague and me, we both have over 45 years experience in the running of public companies and the resource sector. And we work together on projects as diverse as mining and, uh, and geothermal energy and very, very successfully so. And John has operated in numerous uh, countries around the world, from the Philippines, from Thailand, many countries in Africa, Greenland. And I've worked in uh, very similar jurisdictions as well, in the Philippines, Africa, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, South America, and of course, Mexico for the past 10 years. So we have a very, very close relationship with, uh, between the two of us. We've raised well over $300 million for our various ventures over the years wow. and been very successful in, uh, in taking Cerro Caliche to the point right now where it's ready to be permitted. Now, our technical team in Mexico is comprised of uh, two individuals, Jorge Diaz, our VP of, Exploration, uh, uh, VP of Mining, and our VP of Exploration, Mel Herdrick. Now, both of those have over 45 years experience one, of course, in the in the in the finding resources around uh, North America. Now, Mel Herdrick has over five million ounces of gold discovery to his credit. Jorge Diaz has built eleven gold mines in Mexico over the years. Very hands-on people, so we have the knowledge which covers everything that is required to make a company and a project successful. We have technical people, we have financial people, and we have the ability and the drive to make it successful. We on, go on to the project. The project was, has been in the making now for the past eight, eight, seven or eight years. We, we acquired Cerro Caliche in, uh, in uh, 2018. And it was uh, five agreements were entered into at that time. And now we're at the point where uh, the, the property payments, which had been staged over a period of six years, have almost been extinguished now to the point where five of the projects, five of the agreements have been closed and the mineral transfer has been transferred over to our subsidiary in Mexico. And uh, next April with the final payment for the balance of the property and will be easily handled by, by Sonoro at that time. 
The property itself, uh, 1,400 hectares, uh, has uh, over 55,000 meters of drilling on it, uh, 498 drill holes. It has a resource currently estimated by SRK at uh, 440,000 ounces within the pit shells. And according to SRK, surrounding the pit shells drilled and assayed, and which can easily be added to the, the resource in the, in the coming year or so by additional infill drilling. And that should add up to another 300,000 ounces. So mineralized zones right now suggest up to uh, 700, 750,000 ounces uh, for this potential mine of ours. And as it stands so over the past um, three years, and no, actually two, two, just over two years, we've been in the, in the permitting process to waiting for the SEMERNAT, the environmental agency for the Mexican government to approve our project for, for going into production. And so we submitted, uh, after all that drilling that we did, we submitted uh, uh, an application for an, uh, an environmental impact statement to Semernet uh, on the premise that uh, we should be receiving the approval back way back in 2022. Now, because of the issues related to the Mexican government at that time under the previous president, President Lopez Obrador, uh, we were held up and the, the permit was not granted by Semernet. Uh, back in 2022, when it should have been. So now we're at the point right now where we have a brand new government in Mexico, and the the new government under under uh, President Scheinbaum uh, is taking a much more practical and pragmatic approach to dealing with the mining companies. So we are now fast forwarding to 2024, 2025, and we're really taking an, an energetic approach to getting the environmental impact statement approved now. But let me go back to the, the, the company and, and, the, and the structure of the company. We, the, company and the table on the right-hand side shows you the current issued and outstanding in the company of 206 million shares. What's interesting, though, is the insiders of the company, namely the four principals that I just mentioned to you, own 24% of the company. And with our families, I would imagine that we currently tally up to about maybe around 27% of the company. And then in, in, in addition to that, we have a wide distribution of the shares in Germany and Switzerland. 40% of the shares are held in, in Germany and Switzerland. And we're now, John will talk about uh, our encroachment into areas such as Scandinavia and now into the United States. So we'll, we'll go into that in further detail with John. The element for uh, uh, constructing this mine was based upon a business plan we put together in 2018 which determined that in the, the, we had enough data available to us when we started drilling to suggest that uh, this project would be capable of supporting an open pit near surface oxide deposit, which would be amenable to heap leaching. And so we focused on that. So all the drilling we've done has been essentially within the first 80, 90 meters from surface. And we have resisted the, the temptation to go deeper for the higher grade, simply because of the higher risk when you go into, into greater depth. And of course, the additional cost as well. And we've been very fortunate in developing a resource right now with a PEA that was produced by Micon International and Denim Engineering, out of, both out of Toronto, and underpinned by a resource estimate by SRK from the Denver office. And so we have a, a project that is capable of supporting a nine year life of mine currently on the basis of uh, throughput of 11,000 11, tons per day on an open pit basis and uh, produces 33,000 ounces a year on our average over that nine year life of mine. So once again, going back to the business plan, we have enough of a resource now that we can go into production and start generating revenue. The revenue will then be used for additional drilling, which will take us uh, several, you know, probably in the next two years or so, to fully develop the, the potential for the resource, which we believe is as much as 2 million ounces. So the, the business plan has been working extremely well for us in that regard. Now, financing, we'll be talking about the financing, and John can talk about that in a second. But before that, I want to talk about the, the political situation in Mexico. We're very fortunate, timing-wise, right now that Claudia Sheinbaum uh, became the president of Mexico on October the first. 
Prior to that, we had a, a bit of a difficult situation under President Lopez Obrador, where the mining industry was essentially shunned, and there was a potential for a ban on future open pit mines. Now, we didn't believe that would happen because of the ec economic hit that Mexico as a whole and numerous states would take. And so uh, we're very gratified to see President Scheinbaum enacting policies that are giving us comfort that the government is, uh, is now paying attention and recognizing the need for Mexico to be able to approve these, these mines that have been held up for the past few years. And when you consider that the states like Sonora, Sonora State has 25% uh, of this GDP is reliant on mining, Zacatecas 33%, and the list goes on. And Mexico as a whole, 8% of the GDP is reliant on mining. They need to stimulate this economy with 70% of the mines uh, represented by open pit mining. So we are in a great position right now to assist Mexico in coming back from a position of deficit as a whole where the, comp where the country is situated today. And we, we will be participating in the future uh, expansion of, of the industries in Mexico. So one thing that uh, Scheinbaum, President Scheinbaum has reiterated over and over again is that your, our investments are safe in Mexico and she welcomes more and more investments of this nature into Mexico as well. Location wise, we're in Sonora State, probably the finest jurisdiction in all of Mexico for building a gold mine. Uh, 30 about 30 percent of the of the gold produced in Mexico is produced in Sonora State. And we are in a location where we're surrounded by mines, producing mines and soon to be producing. Agni Coigo would be a, a, a name that I, I like to drop once in a while. Uh, they're developing uh, the Santa Gertrudes project, but 10 kilometers to our north. And they've been drilling there for the past three, four years and developing a fairly large resource. Uh, we are surrounded to the south by, uh, or the southeast, uh, by a, a Mercedes mine, which uh, has been operating for about eight or nine years. It's an underground mine uh, and operating at 300, 350 meters below surface. But it's on the same structure as we're located, the same mineralization. And adjacent to us on the west is the Cerro Prieto mine, open pit heap leach. And once again, there's over 200 gold mines in, in Sonora State, large and small. So we're in good company. Uh, and we're getting a tremendous amount of support from the governor of Sonora to enable us to get the permits through Semernat, the environmental agency. So in, in October of 2023, we produced a PEA that was produced by Micon International out of Toronto and Denim Engineering, as I previously mentioned, underpinned by the resource estimate by SRK. And that uh, they used a base case of $1,800 gold and a $2,000 gold uh, uppercase at that time. Now, albeit you know, uh, gold was trading at around the $1,700, $1,800 mark at that point. Far cry from where we're at today, trading at $2,600 and $2,700 gold. But you look at the economics, the $2,000 gold price, net present value pre-tax of $117 million US. That translates into what, $150 million Canadian. We have a market capitalization today of, of under $20 million. So there's room for the share price to appreciate based upon the actual value of the project on that basis. Uh, as far as uh, whether we talk about pre-tax or post-tax, we'll, we'll be plowing the profits back into expanding the resource and expanding the project and expanding uh, the, 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 the other projects in Sonora uh, going forward. So we're not gonna be paying tax for a little while. Now, assuming that Semernet, the environmental agency, were to grant us the environmental impact statement approval today, we are proposing that we would be pouring the first Dore bar within 12 months from today. And I, I'm comfortable stating this because our team under Jorge Diaz has done it in prior projects. Like Colorado, for example, was, was, was done on the basis of uh, uh, five, less than five months from the time they were granted approval to build the mine until they poured the first Dory bar. So 12 months is a fairly conservative estimate in my part. So on that basis, um, uh, I would like to suggest that uh, to, uh, the timing for us currently, as we see it, is the first half 
of 2025 would be the time where we would see the government that under uh, President uh, Scheinbaum being able to, to grant the mining licenses to companies such as ourselves. We're not the only one. We're not being singled out. And so we believe that there will be uh, with a pen, the pent up demand for approvals is building and we're starting to see signs that the Mexican government is responding and Semernat is responding. And so we believe 2025 will be the year for Sonoro to be able to uh, fulfill its promise of getting into production and start to drill in earnest to, to prove up the full extent of the value of the property. And John? Certainly, John, I'll be uh, quite brief on this because Ken's covered everything. The important part on the shareholder side is, is not just the fact of our ownership of 24, 25% and the fact that our cost is about 15 cents a share is that the insiders as such show their commitment to the company every day. And that is borne out by the fact that we have loaned the company about three and a half million dollars. And that money is uh, hard cash, is unsecured, there are no conversion rights, and as stated in the chairman's letter, it's the intention to get repaid from project financing or when we go into production. And that, to me, shows why Sonora is somewhat unique in the junior mining sector. We have the teams Ken spoke to, we have the project, we have the shareholder base, we have a business plan which we adhere to, as Ken said, we have access to funds. But it is worth mentioning, John, as to why we do well with our European shareholders. They tend to look at projects on a three to five year basis and our German Swiss uh, shareholders are solid and they add to their positions whenever we see there's a dip in the market. Um, most recently we've expanded to Sweden and the response from Sweden has been tremendous at, at this stage. So, And also I would add within the USA as a result of the, um, the conference that you organized in Florida recently, we've had some new friends down there as well. So. As a company, I just repeat, I believe that we stand out as a junior. We have all the essential components to be successful. And uh, in ever there's a situation of funding required by the company, um, the insiders step up. That's great, John. Yeah, and I know we talked about that on the last interview extensively, but for the people that are here now, um, I made a few notes. Uh, it sounds like, you know, you guys put you said $3.5 million of your own money forward in the in the form of loans to keep the company going over the last couple of years because of the stress that Mexican companies were under, right? Yeah, I think it's worth mentioning, John, as to why uh, we provided those loans, okay? It was certainly not through poor management. If you look at uh, our company, we've been very firm on a business plan. We had the MIA file, we had project financing lined up, and included in the project financing were the property payments, similar to like a mortgage on a home. You have to pay those. Now, when we had in 2023 and then 24, um, Amlo said, look, proposed ban. And remember, it's a proposal, it was actually absolute. Um, right. The financing fell away. And so we then said, it's too much of a dilution to the shareholder. We're not going to let the project go. We stand behind our commitment, and therefore these loans that are put forward, are, again, are unsecured, no repayment terms, and no special conditions for conversion. This is to show really our demonstration of a commitment to the company. Right, and, and just for those of you that don't understand about conversion and, and that sort of thing, uh, what John is saying is that the $3.5 million that they've loaned the company cannot be converted into new shares. So you saw Ken's slide showing about 206 million shares outstanding, that would be a much higher number if that were to be the case, correct guys? Absolutely, it would be a significant amount. And that's why we look at all our shareholders as being part of an extended family. The Europeans have followed us for years in our projects. And we're glad that uh, we're getting a similar response in Sweden and also from our meetings in, in uh, the USA. Our commitment is to the company. We view our holding of 25, 26% to be a good holding. Therefore, if we have to stand up to make sure that the company is successful, to make sure we don't lose the property, we'll continue to do that. And most recently, uh, we made that announcement of making the final property payment on the Saraclici section. There was a further payment that was made for 50000 for the other part of the property. So we stand behind the company all the way. So uh, shareholders should not be concerned that A, we're not going to be able to fund the company, and B, we're not going to take advantage of the shareholders. We're comfortable where we are. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, obviously, uh, 
Ken, you talked about the team concept and um, your experience and John's experience. And that's the first thing that we look for in a company is the management team, because you can have a great project. You can have the right jurisdiction, but you could have a management team that has what we call a, a certain lifestyle that uh, burns enough cash to where you get insolvent pretty quickly uh, in junior mining in bad years, right? So, um, or you have something like that of left field. I bet if you guys were asked, did you think this could happen to you in 2022? The answer would be, come on, let's let's get real. This would never happen for this long, but here we are, right? So you have to prepare for these things as a small company and live to fight another day. And that's what you've been doing. Um, so, you, you mentioned, John, that you're not interested in doing a rollback. A rollback would be, you know, detrimental to shareholders potentially. Is that is that accurate or? 100%. We view every shareholder, whether they have 100 shares or they have a million shares, as being equal contributors to our success. And we feel that to approach this with a rollback would be to take advantage uh, or to the disadvantage of those shareholders. So we are firm in our position here. We have no intention of a rollback. Uh, we have no intention of converting our loans or, or even endeavoring to do that. The commitment is to get this company to production. And the one thing that's holding us up now is the granting of the MIR and the confidence that we have that it will be approved under the new government. I know there's always hesitations and people are concerned, et cetera, but from the work that's done by our team in Mexico and in Canada in particular down there, we're absolutely confident it's going to happen. As to when, it could be the first quarter or maybe the second quarter next year. But we as a company are committed to move forward and we will make the success. And I think, John, uh, one thing I want to add as well, because I don't, don't think I touched on this, less than 30% of the known mineralized zones in the property have been drilled and assayed to date. And we still have over half a million ounces of, of uh, gold in, within the pit shell, so to speak. And so uh, when you look at the other 70%, uh, we know they're mineralized, that the, the region's are entirely mineralized. We've uh, assayed, drilled, uh, assayed the, uh, the outcroppings at, at surface, <clears throat> and we know they're mineralized, and it's, it stands to reason we will be drilling those into the future. So the potential for two million ounces is realistic, and we will be drilling. As soon as we have uh, the construction underway, the target is we start drilling because you want to generate news while you're constructing the mine. But once we're in production, then we fully ramp up with the, the drilling rigs in order to fully realize upon the potential for the project. Great. And, and so that would extend the mine life from nine years to mm -hmm. something much more significant if you were able to drill. And, and just to point out for the listeners, the reason companies like Sonoro don't drill in years like 2022 and 2023 is you're just not getting paid to do so, meaning the news flow that you generate wouldn't excite the market enough to justify the cost because drilling is very expensive globally. So, you know, the company's done, I think, a good job there of managing capital. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention that Don and I brought up on our interview a few weeks ago is the fact that you have over 30% of the float tied up in good hands. I mean, clearly 25%, as you were saying, John, is in, is in uh, management and insiders. And, and about 40% overseas and in European hands where you've had deep relationships for years. So that prevents what we call a take under, uh, which we've seen many times, unfortunately, in the last couple of years with Marathon, with the, with the Lexco. These were newsletter favorites that did absolutely the wrong thing, in my opinion, by shareholders and sold near the bottom uh, of the cycle. And so you want to live to fight another day. I think that's one of the reasons that your stock price is appreciating here. For those that are listening, just take a look uh, from October 1st when the Mexican news broke about President Scheinbaum to today. I mean, the stock's been in a clear uptrend uh, on higher than normal volume. And that's the kind of stuff that you look for when you're buying something. Uh, you're looking for something that has bottomed and then is starting to accelerate in price uh, and in volume at the same time. And I'll say that it's been doing it um, while some of your peers in Mexico have not performed as well, uh, which is interesting to me. So would you want to talk to that? Maybe the fact that you're in a certain state in Mexico is more beneficial. Is that what you think some of the market participants are looking at? I think there's, there are two parts. Ken can talk about the state, but I want to make sure it's clearly understood. 
we went through a dark period from February until October, market-wise, when there was a uh, that threat or the, the specter of a uh, proposed ban. And so we saw people selling, but when it came down, Europeans were buying. And that's why during those dark periods, um, they were gradually accumulating. So we've probably been quite conservative on the number of percentages over in Europe. And again, I go back to the fact that they come to us and have spoken to us when the share price goes down and say, we're with you, we chance to buy some more shares. So what we saw, I believe, during the summer months was actually the transition of shares in the hands of those who got somewhat nervous to those who believe in the longer term. And why it ex not explode, that's the wrong way to use, but why October the 1st was important is because many people, we have about 9,000 people following us here, they saw that as a good sing signal. This is the time that we can move forward. We have confidence. There's still a large percentage though. We're saying, we don't care if we pay 30 or 40 cents. We just want to see the certificate, right? But yep. what we find in, in Sweden, and why that's important to mention is because in a former company, Crew, uh, which I, I started with another partner, we have 70% of our shareholders in Norway. And so we see Sweden as a natural extension from Europe. And we would go from Sweden, we would hope into to Norway. Always looking for people who see a long-term benefit and an upside potential. Now, there's always traders. It's necessary, obviously, but we have moved up and then we traded millions of shares, I believe, around that, like 10 cents, 9, 10, 11 cents, building a new base. And from our point of view, we call that as actually returning to where we were before <laughs> we had the AMLO statement. So market-wise, we are basically back to where we were a, a year before. Okay. No, and also you you were asking about the whether there was any any uh, relationship between the current increase in our share price and the fact that we're operating in Sonora State. <clears throat> I think that's uh, that's realistic because Sonora is one of the, the the finest jurisdictions in all of Mexico for for building a mine. And traditionally, uh, building gold mines there has been a, a relatively simple process. Now, <clears throat> we, with, when there was a threat uh, of uh, banning open pit mining in the future, <clears throat> four of the of the northern states, including Sonora, uh, took umbrage with that. And of course, uh, were quite prepared to take the the government to court if, if they were to ban open pit mining. Keep in mind, Sonora is, is run by the Morena party as well with Governor Durazo. So it's the same party as, as is running Mexico. And, and there's a strong relationship between Governor Durazo and, and President Scheinbaum. So <clears throat> we don't see uh, any potential in that regard for any legal action to take place. But it shows you the degree of resentment within the, these northern states towards this proposed open pit mining ban. It doesn't make any sense. It would destroy their economies. We're now waiting to reap the rewards of having overlooked these economies for the past few years. And now they're ready to start uh, putting into action a new a, a plan, which will use the mining companies as the spearhead for the recovery of the Mexican economy. Thank you. Um, let's see, there's no questions just yet, but I haven't even said anything about that. So I'll say it now. If anyone has a question, you can just type it into the chat box at the very bottom of your screen there. And uh, as long as it's something that hasn't been asked already, um, I will ask the gentleman to answer that for you. Um, I'll ask one last one while people are just considering that. Um, on that map that you showed, Ken, uh, I saw three major companies. Uh, you mentioned Agnico, AEM. Uh, I saw Fresneo, uh, and I saw uh, Alamos. So, you know, down the road as you're building this out, um, obviously majors like to see permits in hand. Um, would that be something that you guys would consider down the road, you know, a possible sale? Um, of course. If uh, there was a realistic uh, bid for <clears throat> the, the property or the company at some point in the future, we would have to address that seriously and take it to the board, take it to the shareholders if it passes to muster with the board. Now, our goal right now <clears throat> is to increase the value of the ounces in the ground. 
So if we believe that the, the property is capable of supporting 2 million ounces, we want to take it to that 2 million ounce mark. And we right. have the ability to do so ourselves, to finance it and to, to drill it ourselves. <clears throat> In the meantime, if an offer comes along, then we will consider that. But the, the, the most important element is currently the ounces in the ground are valued at around $28 an ounce. <clears throat> Before we can even contemplate any kind of, of uh, relationship with an outside party, I want to see us demonstrating a value uh, of uh, at least $150 to $200 per ounce of the ounces in the ground. <clears throat> We're a long way from that. So the market capitalization has, has to increase dramatically from where it is today before we can start to contemplate any kind of relationship with outside parties. That makes sense. We have one question from Thomas. Uh, what is the detailed strategy and preparation for the financing of the mine once the permit is received? <clears throat> you want to address that, John? We have many opportunities for financing, um, ranging from a gold loan, royalty or, or, or debt and uh, we're not particularly interested in royalty uh, the gold loan depends upon the terms and as does the debt so look at the people involved here my background's in banking in the uk and canada have been involved in uh, financing public companies for 35 40 years major projects around the world so to give a detailed plan out, which may be considered to be inside information, is a little difficult to do. But let's just say we are contemplating every possibility and we're receiving approaches there. So we have no concern about securing the project financing. Once we get the mining license, I think everybody will see uh, this moves into a different stage. I think uh, John as well is worthy of mentioning when the PEA was produced uh, in October 2023, gold was trading at $1,800. And at that time, we were looking at it from the point of view of, oh, yeah, royalty might be applicable because it's less dilution to the shareholders. Well, guess what? We're now go with gold at $2,600, $2,700. It is much more palatable to do an equity financing as part of the project financing. So we, we see a, a, a split of... Uh, I don't know, maybe 60-40 uh, on the basis of debt to equity and for the project finance, that would be very uh, acceptable from my point of view. Uh, and royalty is uh, it would take too much away from the shareholders, uh, and the royalty is forever, as you know. Uh, forward selling of gold is a possibility, and we are certainly looking at uh, seven, several avenues in that regard. So it could be a combination of forward selling gold and uh, debt and equity at the same time. I'd like to add, John, it's very important that this is made. Uh, when we look at our current share price, in our view, it does not reflect a real value of the company. And we under understand why people sit on one side to wait for the license. So we would expect the following to unfold. We'll have a situation whereby the license will be approved. We will announce that. That will have an impact in the, in the, in the stock price, we would believe. So depending on where we're trading and what price we're trading, that's where we will consider uh, a debt and equity combination. But it, it's something that we're very conscious of. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, are there any other questions from the audience? And you can unmute yourself and ask if that's easier for you. Okay, James said that uh, you just answered his question, John. So, <laughs> thanks, James. Yeah, yeah I had no um, idea of the question. <laughs> one thing I, I'll I'll add as a follow up while the audience may be thinking of a question is, um, Ken, what is the uh, when you put that report out? Uh, I'm sure that the capex has gone up because the report is uh, quite a few years old. But what do you think roughly uh, is needed in terms of financing down the road? Yeah, the data for the, the CapEx is just over a year old. And you can assume that uh, with, uh, with inflation, you can probably add 3 to 5% to that uh, $15 yep. million. Dollars. Uh, but uh, the other thing as well is uh, we, we were looking at, obviously, uh, the, the, the mine plan is a work in progress because one of the things that we are very keenly interested in is, of course, the sustainability aspect because it, it has become the real buzzword for... Uh, for mining projects in Mexico and around the world going forward. 
So uh, we are looking at ways, of course, to enhance the sustainability. And what we wouldn't contemplate a year ago because of the, the low goal, the lower gold price at that time and the, the, sh the low share price that we had and the potential for excessive dilution. Now we can look at it and say, all right, we believe that the share price will recover to a, an acceptable level in the future to enable us to se secure more of an equity financing at that time. So we, we can afford to do some tweaking to the mine plan to enhance it from a sustainability perspective. And we are looking at that aspect as well. But I don't see any wholesale changes to the mine plan because it was a very sound mine plan to begin with. And all we can look at it right now is if we can just add a bit more sustainability to certain aspects of it, uh, we will certainly contemplate that. So, but like I said, I, I don't see the, 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 the capital costs increasing dramatically, maybe at the most 10% uh, between last year and now. If I may just say one comment, John, because it has been made. Um, what other interests do we have that are potentially conflicts? And the answer is none. That's the beauty of this company is that the team is dedicated to this company. There are no other companies that they're involved with. So there's no competing conflicts for time or anything like that. And that's why we put forward about Sonora being um, distinctive. I always use the word unique unless somebody can show me anything, anything else because Look at the team, the project, the people, the commitment, the shareholder base, and shareholders uh, are our family. They've grown with us, and we are responsible for them. That's why when we took we provided this loan, we didn't try to take any um, conversion rights, which I think surprised a lot of people, and the fact that it's unsecured. So hopefully what we're demonstrating to everybody, this is a business run by professional people who are commercial but they're not commercial to the extent of being selfish. We want to share with the shareholders the rewards that we believe is due to everybody. That's well put. Well, um, I don't see any other questions. We wanted to end by three, which is two minutes from now. So I'll just wrap it up here by saying that, um, you know, we own the company. We believe in your vision. Um, I think, you are leading the peer group uh, of the stocks that I follow, whether it's gold or silver stocks in Mexico. There's quite a few of them, as you know. Um, but I think that um, once the tide uh, starts lifting all the ships next year, uh, when you see that kind of action, uh, typically like in 2016, who were the leaders? Well, it was First Majestic, AG. It was Core, CDE. It was those kind of names that kept going higher after the you know the crowd started to move higher, so I think you're in a really good position right now, um, and uh, you're you're running the company smartly. And I think uh, you know everyone on this call should be listening uh, for news going forward into Q1. Uh, I think that you know we'll we'll see a lot more then, as I'm sure you can agree in terms of uh, what Mexico's plan is and and the timing of everything. But I think the best part of this for me is that you guys uh, per that graph that you showed are, you know, maximum with a permanent hand on that day, you're 12 to 13 months away from producing, which is huge because many of the companies that are priced like you are three to five years away at, at least. Um, and that takes a long, long time. So you can realize the gold prices of today, you know, a lot sooner, which uh, I think people miss sometimes. So um, with that, guys, I'll uh, I'll wrap it up here. I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, if anyone has any questions, my contact information will be on the final slide here. Happy to reach out to uh, the team here to answer any additional questions for you. And thanks for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. And a, a real pleasure talking to you as well, John, and, and of course, the team that's listening. Thank you, John, and everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone.